Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I am joined here today from an undisclosed location by Alessio. <laughs> Hello. From underneath the mountain home, Fen. Hello. Uh, I'm not in a nuclear bunker like Alessio. No, well, <laughs> Alessio is in a, uh, some sort of uh, villainous island where he constructed a time machine. And I'll be your host, Alexis. Uh, our topic today uh, are one of Hugh Rosenberg's best-known game, Caverna, by myself, and a little bit about its semi-sequel, Cave vs. Cave, by Fen. Uh, then, that time you killed me, a time-traveling murder mystery game by Alessio. And finally, we're going to dive deep into the darkest of dungeon with uh, Darkest Dungeon by Fen. Uh, but first of all, uh, let's start with the um, Standy catch-up. So what have you been up to, Alessio? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> uh... What I'm doing, playing, is uh, but mostly playing Eon Trespass Odyssey. I'm in the tail end of cycle, cycle 2, so still uh, in the middle of Sparta. But uh, that aside, I, I've received and I'm trying uh, uh, three cases from the Hidden Games uh, series which is uh, a very, very weird uh, investigation uh, game. It's cool because you receive uh, at home these uh, packages, which are basically the entirety of the case. You get stuff, physical stuff, like... Uh, uh, well, uh, it's a bit spoilery, so it's, you, you get like newspapers, uh, fingerprints, uh, uh, business cards of... Uh, of stuff and uh, you get is it a little bit y like uh, curious correspondence uh yeah it is a bit like that but you get the f uh, it's weird because you get the actual physical components uh, which mingle with uh, with online stuff and uh, the research you can do you can uh, get to websites uh, you don't actually play like you get an app you play searching for the actual fake websites, for a, for example, for a, for a restaurant, or you enter uh, uh, actual police uh, fake police database databases with uh, uh, recordings of uh, of witnesses and stuff. It's beautiful because uh, it's actually uh, it works like a charm. I, I have to say I, I did the first case of the three, and uh, it's a blast. So. Possibly it's material uh, we could talk about in the future, but uh, le let's see if uh, the following cases are as good as the as the first one. Probably there are more. I hope so. <laughs> and yeah, and that's it. After that, it's just a lot of Kickstarter campaigns, some of which are interesting, some of which are reprint campaigns of stuff. For instance, there's a reprint for Bossa, we reviewed it in the Patreon, and it's a kind of nice Japanese game. Uh, it's simple and uh, it's very fun to play, so for instance, that's one of the interesting kickstarter there's a kickstarter campaign for blueprints of mad kid uh, ludwig which is not a game from stone mayer games this time but uh, uh, it's a flip and write game with the theme of the castles of mad king ludwig so we will see how that fares and uh, the, it has been announced the the, the new campaign for the expansions of Townsfall Tassel. I I actually had the chance to play test some of the stuff, so I cannot talk about uh, a lot of that, but I just wanted to say that it's scheduled for March because that's news. And uh, well, that's basically it, I guess. And what about you, Fen? Uh -uh. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what about you, Alexis? <laughs> I wanted. I, I want actually to rewind that. Uh, <laughs> never mind. It's let's go back in time. What about you, Alexis? Uh, not too much. I've been mostly focused on on work, so not too many uh, board game news recently. Um, the the only recent um, 
time that I got excited, well, uh, that, that I got um, emotional about a bold game recently was uh, a terrible update by uh, the Kickstarter that shall not be named. So, um, Boo! <laughs> exactly. Waste I'm not going of to plastic! Uh, very much so. Uh, and especially uh, even more of a waste of plastic when we know that in uh, 2018, uh, Poots brought a fully made uh, plastic board to demo the uh, Black Knight that they made just for Gen Con, uh, and somehow it took them four years to make a worse product, uh, a worse looking product that still isn't out. So I have no idea what this company is doing, and at this point I'm just starting to get annoyed at um, every time that there's a, an update coming out that isn't. Uh, the game is coming to your dolls yeah. today. Um, I'm not going to rag on it too much because I looked yeah. at the Kickstarter comments and uh, I think it trended quite negative on the whole look of the thing. And um, yeah. uh, some of the comments that came from APG kind of failed to read the room in respect to how people were feeling. Myself, it's the first time I looked at something from the Kickstarter and thought, I, I kind of wish I hadn't backed this element. Um, I, it's uh, going to be... I don't know if I'm going to do anything with it. I'm not interested in painting it. I'm kind of like, I'm going to stick with the cardboard board, I think. Um, I, I really don't know what I actually expected because I've seen, um, I've seen like, you know, uh, fan made ones and I've always looked at those and been like, oof, I'm glad I don't have one of those. So, uh, well, yeah. I, I think that it was like, if it was separated tiles, like what they shown for the Black Knight, something that is easy to, to set up and easy to, to put back. And that could like um, account for a, sl a slight um, 3D turrets that you can put over it. Like, I think that it could be all right, uh, but it's definitely something that I regret having backed too. But uh, at the very least, I'll be able to eBay it uh, at some yeah. Uh, at some point in the future, so it's not all lost. Yeah. In any case, it's not really something that we should delve into. Uh, I, I do want to say, um, I don't actually want to always rag on them. I, I am going to say that the Kingdom Death Simulator is a good product. It is actually a really good product. So <laughs> there, there is that. Of, yeah. co of course it is. They worked on it like the last uh, six yeah. years. Yeah. Um, it's, it's excessive, which is to be expected. Um, because you know, and um, the I almost had an ept epileptic fit in respect to the menu. I have to get the, like I can't look at the menu when navigating it at the start because it, it's got very fast flashing black um, stuff. So hopefully that gets fixed. But um, like mechanically, it's really good. It really dunks on, frankly, anything I've played electronically before within that medium. So um, it that's yeah I. I think that has a good future, especially as an affordable way for people to get in and play the game or play the game with other people. Still, <laughs> we're not we're not going to get into that. We will talk all about the the monstrous Kickstarter that shall not be named, which I just named uh, in the future when there's some stuff that's arrived. Yeah. Imagine that. Eh, I'm sure it's coming this year. Yeah. I'm sure that it's going sure. to come towards the end of the year or maybe the start of the that, next. That's my that, prediction. That's a bold affirmation, sir. Yeah. I'll be very disappointed if I don't get a pencil in my box. Very yeah. sad. <laughs> in any case, that's a topic for another day. Uh, in the meantime, uh, what's happening with you, Fen? Well, it's been a while since I've been on. Um, been back and forth to Stockholm a bit for some various uh, personal things. Um but on the whole, uh, several Kickstarters have arrived. Final Girl, really good. Um, Darkest Dungeon, more about that later. Uh, do, 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 do. Artisans of Splendor Veil, Sp Splendent Veil, which I'm not going to be able to play until my friends visit. Uh, but I've heard Bad Rulebook, Good Game, um, which is, I can live with that. I can learn to play a game with a bad rulebook. I've done <laughs> that before. Uh, but mostly this week, uh, apart from we've had a cold flurry, which has uh, kind of driven us inside and dug into the fuel stockpiles, uh, we heat the house with yeah. wood, um, is that I've been looking into getting some um, uh, dog dog buttons, uh, speech buttons. You know what those are? 
Uh, okay. No, I, I, right. Are so, you, are they like clicker training thing? No, 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 no. So not really. No. That's so the, the thing is, like many, a lot of people don't quite understand, or maybe you haven't owned a dog, but dogs actually have a very large vocabulary. They can learn a, a large amount of words, what the meanings are, and concepts. It's like when you say walkies to a dog, their ears prick up, they can run into the door. Um, so they can learn a lot, but they don't have vocal cords to communicate. And we can't really understand a lot of their communication because it's smell-based, tail-based. So it, it can be frustrating for them at times. Uh, our dog's very smart. Everyone's dog's always very smart. But, um, you know, ours is another one of those smart dogs. And I've decided to get these things which are like speech buttons. So what it is, is you have a button and you'll put an image on it, say a sun. And when the button's pressed, it'll say outside. And you teach the dog to understand that when they press the button, it means I want to go outside. So by putting the button, but say by the door, when they go outside, you press the button, open the door, they get used to that. And so they learn, hey, if I press this button, it says outside, I get to go outside. So outside means outside. And you repeat that with other things. And so they can eventually learn to string together words that are relatively like simple sentences. Like the, you can look on, you can see on wow. YouTube and similar. There's um, a bunny, I think is the name of the dog. One of the ones made this famous first of all, or early first of all. And bunny can express things like mom, love you. And a particularly endearing one is where uh, bunny was having some trouble <laughs> and was asked what was wrong. And bunny went, ouch, touch the ouch button. And uh, bunny's owner was like, what ouch, what's ouch? And then bunny went, poor, ouch. <laughs> and still didn't quite understand so I was asked again and Bunny went poor stranger poor ouch and it turned out there was a uh, mm -hmm. bit of a thorny plant stuck in between Bunny's um, their fingers you know the equivalent of fingers pad in the pad oh. um, and that was causing yeah. Bunny discomfort and they were able to communicate please check my paws and take this out so you know it, it, it Wow, that, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, it's similar yeah. with cats. You can actually do it with cats, although cats are notorious for being less keen to please humans, so they're harder to deal with. They domesticate themselves. Anyway, I'll be looking at those. Uh, at the moment, they're on sale, and they're like 130, 140 euros for a good set with a very nice structure that lets you put all the concepts in different places, and you lay out a bunch of hexagons to lock it in place so stuff doesn't move around. The dog always knows where everything is. Uh, so I'm hoping that stays on sale for a while. Um, otherwise, I'll have to wait for it to drop back down again because the full price is like 350 euros, which is, Oof. yeah, yeah. I could get a starter kit, but I mean, I, I just, I want to get in with a whole load at once. So that's the plan. That's the main thing I've been looking at and considering beyond playing lots of games. And just today, um, I finally made order for Cantaloupe 1 and 2 arrived, which are Friedman Freese, um, uh, yeah. logic puzzle story game books. So I'll probably talk about yeah, yeah the talk best, about them in the future. The, the best for the Manfreeze. Uh, uh, actually, uh, just to check, since a lot of Kickstarters arrived, nobody did receive the did receive uh, Frosthaven yet. No, right? nothing yet. No Frosthaven. Okay. Um, there's Frosthaven seems to be loitering around the uh, close to shipping kind of thing. Same thing. Yeah, for months. Yeah. A uh, similar thing, like, for me, Vindication is on the way. Uh, Final Girl Season oh, yeah, 2 is nearly here. I think it's it's stuck in, snagging customs for EU, which seems to happen a lot. EU are very tight on their customs. But, yeah, no, not those. Still, uh, I think it's time we get on with our topics, because uh, time is short. But I'm going to avail the listeners with a little story. Um, a little insight into my my life. So we go back to like 2007 when I was just starting university and uh, studying um, and I worked in a local game store. Unfortunately, the store's long since closed. Um, bit of a tragic story, that one. I'll tell it sometime in the future. Uh, but we used to play, ever since it came out and I was so excited about this game, uh, Uwe Rosenberg's Agricola. And it was the game we would play in the shop when things were slow or if customers came in like regulars they could join in and play as well it was great it played well two players it played with more but ultimately i ended up really falling out of love with agricola because of 
it's it's a family planning system like the game is notoriously stingy but and i can forgive that because everyone's under the same situation but when it turns out that the whole fight is about who gets the family planning first um and that makes a huge difference i know i'm simplifying it for agricola like lovers I've played a few hundred games of it, okay? So, you know, it reached a point where I was like, I don't want to play this. I got rid of it. We're moving. And I picked up Agricola All Creatures Big and Small, which is the two-player version that's basically animal farming and breeding. I much prefer um, Agricola All Creatures Big and Small. Fantastic. Really enjoyed that. But in 2015, I got to play um, another version, an evolution of Agricola that just... I like I've not been able to get it because it's a bit expensive and you know there's a it, it tends to sell out very quickly but uh it's just it's everything I wanted Agricola to be and um as a consequence I really have come to love playing that game C Caverna I, I know I know I know I know <laughs> So uh Caverna came out in 2013, uh, while Agricola came out in 2006, if I'm probably... Uh, 2007. Correct? 2007. Yeah. And it was, it was uh, both of those are game by U. Rosenberg, and Caverna is definitely the successor to Agricola. It follows the same sort of rule framework uh, for worker placement game, but in my opinion, it is a net improvement of Agricola, and it's pretty much the uh, agreed opinion for most people. Uh, and in my personal case, it is my favorite uh, EU Rosenberg that I've played so far, but I still need to play uh, the one that you recommended recently about, I want to say fish? Nussford. Uh, Nussford, yes. Nuss That's the one. I, I, I'm just going to like quickly just interrupt you and go, yeah, my rankings go, my favorite Uwe Rosenberg is uh, Bonanza, then it is A Feast for Odin with the Norwegians expansion, then it's Nussford, and then it's Caverna, and it's your floor. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the game is for one to seven player, uh, although there is a solo mode and a two player mode, but those two aren't as good as the um, more than three people one, I would say. Uh, the playtime average between 30 and 40 people per player, so uh, 30 and 40 minutes per player. Okay, everyone, we uh, need 30 people per player to represent all the dwarves. <laughs> I hope you brought all your families, your extended family. It is it is quite a heavy game on that on that regard, and I've definitely had parties that uh, games that that lasted for like uh, two hours easily, um, and you also have include uh, to include some rule explanation time uh, at the start if you're playing with new players, uh, but uh, all of that still uh, allows it to be uh, one of the mainstay in people's best game list. Uh, it's always somewhere in there if someone has a, a top 100. On BGG, it's uh, number, f it's ranked 41 on the overall uh, top games, I think. Correct, uh, and I, 40 on strategy. Yeah. And I would say that it deserves that spot uh, very much, uh, despite its slightly cumbersome nature. So. In Caverna, you play as a colony of dwarves that have decided to build themselves a new settlement. Uh, each player has their own mind board uh, divided into a thick and dense forest and a yet to be dug mountain. Uh, the forest side will be used for planting crops and putting down a pasture, while the mountains allow you to uh, mine it down and building facilities into the excavated rooms. Uh, the point of the game is to amass victory points uh, but there's a lot of different ways to earn them, and this is kind of where Caverna kind of uh, brings itself together, I would say. So there's a few resources, a couple of types of crops, uh, four different animals with uh, each of them having their own little rules. For example, you can have uh, sheep. Uh, you can keep more sheep in your pen if you have a sheep dog. You can put mon uh, donkeys in the mine. You can keep uh, pigs in the wood before uh, cutting down the, the wood. Um, and you have also a board listing facilities where you can that you can buy using resources, each of them uh, granting you some new stuff. So you can have uh, new sleeping quarters to uh, have more dwarfs, so more workers to place on the uh, action board later. You can also uh, have economic facilities that tell you to get more resources faster and uh, victory facilities that give you alternative way to get uh, victory points. So for example, you get uh, points for every couple of uh, 
call uh, rosters that you have at the end of the game or if you have uh, one of each type of animals you can get a couple more victory points uh, there's different uh, solution you only start with two uh, dwarfs so those are your workers in this game that you can put down on an action base uh, space on the action board to occupy it uh, and the action board is kind of where Caverna uh, makes itself uh, way better than, than Agricola and than most uh, worker placement game, I would say, because the action, uh, the action boards, you draw actually the, the action that you can use. So at the start of every game, they're going to be completely different and randomized, um, forcing you to adapt your strategy to the action that you'll be able to do. Uh, so that the game is constantly fresh because of that. Uh, those actions could be to dig into the mountain, to create new rooms, to build new facilities for those rooms, uh, gaining resources or building pastures. There's just a bunch of them. And as I said, they're kind of randomized every game. So every few turns, uh, new cards are drawn, unlocking new actions. Um, and uh, as the turn progress, you will also have... Um, growing seasons where pairs of animals will give you new animals and crops will produce more for you to gather later. Um, the game only lasts 12 turn. Uh, at the end of the 12th turn you count your victory points, uh, you deduce the empty space on your board and the missing animal species because you, you need to have a complete set. Uh, and if you can't feed your dwarves every turn you'll also lose some points. And that's basically the general gist of the game. Uh, but Caverna's best aspect is definitely its playtorial strategies. Uh, it's a game that always plays differently and keeps you on your toes. Where uh, Agricola kind of had very set ways to win, as uh, Fan introduced, uh, Caverna just, just is always going to be different. Yeah. And even a good player will have to revise their strategy mid game. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd go as far as like defining the difference between the two of them is Agricola goes, you have to do everything and we're not going to give you the resources to do it. Whereas Caverna goes, hey, go nuts, do whatever you like. There's a whole lot of things. Pick the, the, the little settlement you want to make and you'll get points for it. And I, I really like, I prefer Uwe when he takes his mechanics and makes them generous instead of stingy. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Agricola, definitely, at the end of the game, you were not able to do everything that you wanted to be, and you feel sad about it. Caverna, you came very close to do everything uh, that you wanted to do if you didn't manage to do it. Yeah, Caverna echoes that feeling of when you play a really good um, settlement or civilization building game, and you've constructed a humming city, and at the end of it, you look and you go, I made this, and this looks cool. You get to look down on your board with the little dogs and donkeys and dwarves, and over at the sacrifice pit, and you don't talk about that area of shame, and you go, I made this. <laughs> and it, it, it feels good, and there's always a nice that nice moment at the end where everyone looks and goes, hey, check out my settlement, which I love. I almost think yeah. maybe Uwe, because the theme is a bit odd, I think maybe Uwe like, played a herd of Dwarf Fortress and decided... Let's do that because it, it, That's it really does that feel I was like going a, to mention. yeah, it feels like a cut down dwarf fortress, which I think released two thousand and six, the original. Yeah, I think that the caverna it's an easy dwarf fortress actually. <laughs> Although the best the best part of the dwarf fortress is when you leave it play itself. <laughs> yeah, you can do that with caverna, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and uh, to to go back onto uh, Agricola a little bit uh, more, there's also the, the one big difference also is that you don't have as much maintenance and upkeep. You need to feed your dwarves, but that's very easily done. Uh, it doesn't feel like a starvation simulator like Agricola sometimes yeah. was. Uh and I guess exploration of weapons, actually. Yeah, there's, there's also like a, a weapon <laughs> like a, a weapon where you can arm your dwarves to get treasures and stuff. But that's that's like more in depth. Yeah. Because that's kind of the thing about Caverna is that there's just so many different ways to play it and to do something. And as you said, Fen, at the end of the game, very often uh, after comparing your or, uh, victory points, I always look at the boards of the other people and realize, oh, we had like completely different tactic and and all of us managed to get pretty close in terms of victory points because the game is uh pretty well balanced it is usually. it is um i have 
uh, two criticisms of the game. Number yep. one is it, it really doesn't need the seventh player parts and it probably doesn't need the sixth player parts. Maybe they could have been an expansion because um, the box is heavy and the game is expensive and I wouldn't want to play this with more than five players, I think, and preferably I'd play it maybe three or four. Um, second criticism in respect to it is something I've just... Uh, um, uh, hang on, I've forgotten. Right, the second criticism is so minor, it slipped my mind entirely uh, into respect to what it is. Um, then in which case we'll forget about that. And I'll ask, have you played either of the expansions at all? Because I keep looking at them and going, ooh. I have not, because as you mentioned, uh, the game is already uh, kind of heavy. It's it's uh, hard to, to transport. I'm, and I usually don't play the game at home. I usually bring it to friends. So I, I'm not sure if getting Aha! myself a whole expansion Aha! box is... <laughs> Second criticism. The adventuring yes. system is really like a, a prisoner's dilemma. You cannot let just one person do it. You cannot let one person not do it. You need to always split <laughs> how you're going to handle it between the group. Because otherwise, if anyone gets to do it all by themselves or one person ignores it entirely, that person has too much of an advantage. That's, I think the balance on that track's not super great. That was the other yeah. thing. Um, it is a fun mechanic, yeah. and I love the justification they put in the book for the various things, which is a real reach at times. Like, you know, my dwarf went venturing and came back with some wheat. Good job. Excellent, good. Well done, Bjorn. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, that was the, that's the other criticism I cut in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I hoped you'd played The Forgotten Folk, because... That lets you play different species, which I think is super cool as a concept. I, I, I really like to try it at some point. Mm. I've just... Uh, <laughs> I, the, the base game is already really good and uh, constantly fresh. So I never really felt like I needed an expansion, even though I wanted mm. to try them. Yeah, I, I think for... Uh, my, like my partner and I, uh, dwarves, like we're going to pick dwarves over most tra fantasy races. Unless I can play trolls. Um, I don't know if trolls are in, uh, in as an option. Uh, yeah, they are. Okay, definitely. Fantastic. You've got um, <laughs> humans, elves, trolls. Uh, these are in German, so I think gnomes, maybe dark elves. Uh, my German is not good enough to identify the rest. But I guess I'm going to have to look <laughs> into that. And the latest film was 2022, which is about orcs are on their way to plunder your homely caves. Hmm. Well... Perhaps we'll look into those and come back to the listeners later. Uh, uh, my only small criticism about uh, Caverna, uh, really, that, that hasn't been mentioned, is that uh, while the game keeps itself constantly fresh and that uh, because of that, experienced players don't always roll onto new player. There's always a, a player that, it, that knows how to play a, a worker placement game will be able to get into Caverna pretty quickly and... And probably g get a, a good score, and there's there's less of a. I agree, Cola. If you know the right strategy, you can just roll on to anybody that hasn't played it. Uh, Caverna no, is a little it... bit less the case, uh, but the yeah. problem is that it also comes with a little bit of uh, decision paralysis with the amount of options that you have. Um, I, I definitely know some players that have a, a hard time getting into that, and also um, reading the rules and and. It's kind of heavy to get into it, but once you do, uh, it's really a beautiful game. Uh, I always think of it as sort of the personification of what people think of when they say a Euro game. Um, but that just might be the uh, Euro Zenberg factor, because every one of his games are uh, extremely Euro game. Um, and yeah, the, the little bit extra that, that makes this game uh, even better for me uh, is, as you mentioned, uh, it is uh, the idea of using dwarfs that build a new settlement is inspired by one of my favorite games, uh, Dwarf Fortress. And uh, if anybody is interested, right now the game just came out in its uh, version 50 on Steam with a brand new UI graphics and even a tutorial. Uh, if anybody wants to dive into a, an amazing settlement simulation game, uh, maybe look into uh, Dwarf Fortress. Um, and that's about it on my end. Um, and we, we already got a, a fair few comments of, on your part, uh, Fan. I think that your, your love for the game is uh, pretty, pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, um, it is indeed. I think, it's, I think it's a joy to play. 
Yeah, I, I, I would like to add that you can try Caverna any time on Board Game Arena. Not sponsored. Because it's <laughs> uh, it's not it's not sponsorship. It, yeah, actually, you have to play to to pay to start a game, but you can you can get into any game started by someone else. It's uh, actually a pretty good uh, simulation, and it's uh, the only thing I I have to I have to criticize about Caverna is that it's uh, it's a bit slow paced for what it does. So uh, actually, for me, playing it on Board Game Arena is the the definitive way of playing Caverna. Actually, although I, I have to say uh, the wooden the wooden tokens, uh, meeples, and stuff are beautiful. That's my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I'm not gonna play if I can't have little wooden dogs. Uh, although having <laughs> said that, now I'm gonna take a brief moment to talk about Caverna Cave versus Cave. Uh, this is part of the Lookout Games series that takes Uwe Rosenberg games and strips them down to smaller uh, two-player versions. Caverna is a bit different to Agricola, um, the Agricola version, because first of all, it has a better name, Cave vs. Caves, easier to remember. And secondly, it actually plays solo and two-player. Um, it essentially just gives you the cave half and you have a bunch of tiles that you will uh, do actions to excavate and all of that kind of thing. Um, and it's a lot stripped down and simpler. No tokens, you use one of these tokens up and down in a shelf mechanic. Sorry, no meeples. You use tokens up and down a shelf mechanic to represent your resource levels. So it cuts down on the number of obscene amount of resource pieces that are in Caverna. Um, and it's, it's a fine experience, but ultimately, I think unless you are consistently looking to play solo or play two player, you really should just consider splashing out on Caverna itself and skip on Cave vs. Cave because the game is fine. Uh, it's enjoyable, it plays well, it's smooth, it's it's clean, the rules are good to follow, there's a great glossary, all of that. But at the end of it all, you're just kind of looking at this board with a cave or a slightly bigger cave and some tiles and there's no soul, there's no life to it. And for me at least, I'm just not... I'm not as engaged. It doesn't feel like a settlement. It just feels like a points gathering exercise and comboing different rooms together. So I that's my recommendation is I would probably skip on Caverna Cave versus Cave. It's also a very the big box version is very empty. It's like it's like a packet of crisps or you know chips for Americans. It's fifty percent air. So that, that's, that's my... weird for a, a game inspired by Caverna. Because the, the the original box is so full of things, and when I received it, I, it was just like five times denser than I imagine it to be. Yeah, no, this this you know original caverna contains a forest worth of wood in it, and this one has like that tree out in the garden that fell over. That's that's the limit of its contents in paper form. So, uh, not really a recommendation for me. I think it's fine. Wonderful. Well. Fine is already quite good. Um, so uh, now that we we've done uh, dugging the the fortress uh, and we can let it uh, go to abandon for a few years, then uh, we definitely will have some type of uh, madman that will uh, dig into it and build a lair inside of that cave. Um, and this is um, a very long. S yeah. Can I have a Balrog in mind? <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely have a Balrog into the Lake of Fire under it. But that is a very uh, slow um, segue into uh, a game with a mad scientist that built a time machine and decided to kill themselves with it. Uh, yes, kind of. Actually, uh, this is uh, you. Uh, actually, uh, we are talking about the time you killed me, which is uh, in which you are two players, and uh, each one, or uh, actually one of these two players, is the inventor of time travel. Of course, the other one is the one who knows the inventor of time travel and uses time travel to kill off the original inventor so that they can claim the the discovery for them. And uh, basically, a game at the time you killed me is reenacting this uh, uh, this string of murders because actually it's uh, a beautiful game uh, and 
and it has to do with time travel and it can be a bit complicated but it's extremely fun uh, i can do a bit to describe the game to you but uh, understand that uh, uh, this game has a beautiful manual but before that i have to say uh, one thing about uh, the publisher which is pandasaurus games uh, now uh, we know that pandasaurus games is a small gig of uh, is a small company actually in the us uh, distributing a lot of games we know for instance machikoro for instance dinosaur island the roar of right and dinosaur island the actual game it made the loop they made the, the wolves currently and uh, uh, and uh, the time you kill me uh, and brew they have been yeah Very and brew, mean, and brew, actually yeah yeah <laughs> anyway uh, they are uh, a bit in the center of a small storm caused by uh, employees of uh, uh, of pandasaurus games lamenting that they are a bit overworked in a toxic workplace environment that they are lamenting that they are not getting their paychecks in time and uh, stuff like this mostly they are complaining about poor management of the company uh, now uh, this is uh, uh, a side thing about the publisher but it's important to know because uh, of course uh, we don't we don't want as a podcast to promote uh, any abusive behavior or workplace environment or something yeah like this. D- d- well said i just want to add to it like um, it's just important for businesses to protect and look after their workers. And America in particular really needs to start getting on the union train because, um, you know, the people with power only have power because the masses that don't have it do not all pull in the same direction. So it, it's understandable. Like, it's always easy to be, oh, can you stay a bit late and do a bit more? We're so close. We've got a deadline. And then eventually it could end up being like the video game industry, which is a culture of exploiting and overworking people and we just we don't want board games to get there and be that you know, board games yeah. board games for people by people and you know made with care that's that that's also always something to to add is that uh with any industry that relies onto a hobby or something that people are passionate about uh, about like board games or video games it's easy to feel uh, interested enough in the product that you're like oh I, I can work a little bit more because it's it's fun because i i enjoy things but it you know it shouldn't be forgotten that it's still work and that people still need uh protection from abusive workplaces uh where they can possibly be uh, overworked and exploited so it's it's good to to keep an eye on that. Uh, Pandasaurus had like seven employees that came out against them, seven past employees, which for small companies like that is kind of worrying. Something to keep an eye on, something to maybe uh, uh, look into before buying one of the game. But um, yeah, read not going to, read both yeah. sides of the story. Um, be aware, be eyes open, and just you know consider and think before you do make decisions despite that we're gonna be look at uh that time what you killed me bud um with like an honest and fair look of what the game is like because i believe you quite like the game yeah because the game is beautiful and it's fun and it's everything it's okay let's start from the beginning although with time travel it's not important where you start actually (laughs) in this game you are playing like a chess like game on three boards from left to right you have a board which is four by four squares which is the past another board in the middle which is the present and another board to the right which is the future Uh, you have white pawn versus black pawn At the beginning, you have one pawn in the same place in past, present and future. The goal of uh, every player is to eliminate, to murder uh, all copies of uh, uh, the opponent's pawn in at least two of these eras. Okay, Uh, so if at the end of your turn you have uh, your opponent as the remaining pawn on one or less eras you have won the game and that's it uh, now uh, since we are talking uh, murdering across time it gets complicating the uh, beautiful and everything first uh, the third sequence the third sequence is uh, simple 
you have the first player and the second player. The first player starts in the past, this, the last player, the second player starts in the future. At the beginning, the turn is simple. You, you decide which is your active copy in your active era. So uh, first player is in the past, decides, its, uh, decides their own active copy, which is its pawn, that turn, which is the pawn which will take actions. And then you take two actions with that pawn. After that, you move the focus to another era. You cannot be in the same era for the for two turns uh, uh, consecutively, and uh, and that's the end of your turn. Then it uh, it's the opponent's turn, and so on until someone right. wins. Right, that sounds very straightforward. Uh, when do we get to the plastic elephant? Yeah, uh, act actually, that's a bit spoilery, but I. I um, now, this is beautiful because everything in this game is completely uh, locked into the narrative. The game is completely abstract and uh, you play it, but it's a lot of fun because everything has quips about time travel, uh, about elephants, but we will get to that later. <laughs> and, uh, and everything is uh, time travel themed. It's beautiful because uh, your actions are basically trying to squish your opponent you are basically killing your opponent by uh, squishing them against walls. You move your pawn, you can uh, do two actions. Uh, the, the basic action is basically moving, so you move in an orthogonal direction one square, and that's one action. If you move into another object which can be pushed, you are pushing that object along. If you push uh, an object against something else that cannot be pushed, that object is squished. So basically, you are pushing your opponent into a wall and the opponent dies. That's basically it, the basics of murder. Now, uh, the beautiful part uh, about this is that you can, for instance, create a paradox. If you are pushing an opponent into another copy of that opponent, the opponent, uh, both copies get killed because you create a paradox. Then you can move into another era. If you move from one another era to, uh, to from an era to another era past that for for instance from the past to the present or from the present to the future you are taking your pawn and putting your pawn in the same square in that new era but if you move your pawn from an era to a previous era for instance from the future to the present or from the present to the past you are actually creating a copy because you are moving your pawn to another era but uh, now that you have two pawns in the past uh, the pawn that has just moved with time will be the pawn that is in the present so you're basically copying yourself in the past uh, the cool thing and the important tactical thing about this is that uh, when you move uh, into another era, you are creating a copy, but uh, you are now active in that new era. So if you want to pull a quick murder into another era, you just move there and then push to death. And that's the basics of the game. Now, uh, like Fen said, there are actually this game is uh, in four chapters. It's a kind of narrative game. You are actually following a small, funny narrative uh, in which on each chapter you get a new power and new game elements. The first chapter we, we, with which you begin is growth, in which you basically have seeds. Uh, you have seeds which are planted, and uh, if you plant a seed in an era, you get a shrub in another era, which is an immovable object uh, where, uh, against which you can murder your opponent. And in the even following era, for instance from the past to the future, you get a tree. The tree can be toppled and it can destroy, it, it can kill uh, by toppling and then the tree being toppled stays there as an, immo as an immovable object. So that's it, the growth mechanism. It's the first part and it's beautiful because you get an object which gets bigger with time. Uh, the second chapter is the statues, uh, which is beautiful because the statues are stone. So they are 
uh, always the same in all the eras, starting from the uh, from the era where you build them. So it's beautiful because when you move a stone, you move a stone in that era and in all subsequent eras. But uh, uh, if you move it in the present, you won't affect the stone in the past and so on. If you build a statue, you are building a statue in that era in all subsequent eras, but not in the era previously. So uh, that's actually a lot to do with stones. Uh, even moving the statues is a move that gets propagated. So actually from the past you can get to do damage uh, in the future. And uh, that's a lot of other different playstyles. The third chapter is the elephant actually. And uh, it's beautiful because you have an elephant. The elephant of course as the, the, the third chapter is called memory of course. and. Uh, uh, the elephant is uh, an actual elephant, which is a popular means of transportation uh, in the future. And uh, uh, when you can train this elephant to obey you, when you have trained your elephant, you put on uh, that elephant a little hat of uh, your color, just like in real life, they say. <laughs> it's beautiful. very cute in uh, game, but I absolutely do not recommend you ride elephants anywhere in the world the way that they no, are no, trained no. is horrific but these plastic elephants have the best time because they get to squish humans those you can ride yeah. those you can ride the plastic ones yeah the, the elephants are beautiful for two reasons first is that uh, when the ele since the elephant remembers when you tra you can uh, uh, approach an elephant and train and train them when you train an elephant you can steal the training from your opponent or uh, actually give uh, your training to an untamed elephant. When an elephant is trained, it's trained in all subsequent eras. So it's trained forever because an elephant remembers. After that, you can order a trained elephant to, do, uh, to move. So basically, the, if you are in the same era of an elephant, in any square, you can the order an elephant to move the elephant differently from any other object in the game they do not push they trample so they squish automatically whatever they get into the only limitation of an elephant is that an elephant cannot move another elephant so they are immovable objects you can squish people against the elephants actually and uh, the, the the fun part about this is that the training is only uh, uh, from your era, uh, uh, from the current era uh, and forward. So if you are stealing the training of an elephant in the present, the elephant in the past remains trained to the other to, to your opponent, and that gets messy real quick. After that, there's only a fourth chapter when you basically draft powers and uh, you draft two powers and uh, from the previous uh, chapters and then you play games. Now, uh, the fourth the fourth chapter <laughs> the fourth chapter has uh, has multiple achievements and every achievement unlocks stuff since I didn't manage yet to unlock all achievements, I cannot talk at length about this, but one thing I can say about this game is that it's a blast to play, it's beautiful, uh, the, the only thing is that you can imagine this game gets really complex, and it has only one downside, if you are playing with your opponent, with, with your friend, who is actually a chess enthusiast, they will... Uh, they will be paralyzed by analysis, analysis paralysis a lot because basically uh, they will try to calculate moves in all times uh, at all the same time and then you will move your focus to the era they weren't thinking you would be going and they will be oh crap <laughs> so uh, that's it it's a very complex game which is very simple and very fun to play for everyone all right yeah, I definitely yeah. like the sort of uh, chess-inspired aspect of it. That's definitely yeah. dragging my, my attention. Yeah, for uh, to be extremely clear, since you have basically one type of, 
of Pawn, I'd call it multidimensional Onitama. It's not exactly that, because Onitama is mostly trying to move in an efficient way without, having, without giving to the opponent the move they need to kill you. But it's kind of the same with multiple dimensions, because if you uh, swap the cards with actually not leaving, uh, uh, not leaving an era where your opponent could do a lot of damage, it's kind of the same feeling as playing Onitama, but a bit more complex. Actually, way more complex. That seems like a very interesting game. I, <laughs> I have not heard about it at all. Um, I might... Oh, I, I, I was searching it since 2000. I, I think I, I was following it since the announcement in 2020, but uh, I think it came out in 21 at the end uh, because of the COVID. But the problem was that Pandasaurus uh, d stopped shipping worldwide, so it was a problem finding someone who imported that. Uh, I searched for it an at Essen. In the end, I found it on an importer, so I... Got it. Fi I finally got it, and I'm playing the heck out of it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's my recommendation. As a w as a one versus one player ge playing game, I, I give it an uh, eight out of, uh, eight out of ten. All right. I I, I, I like the the fact that it has a, a very strong story and narrative as uh, aspect from it, from what it looks like. Yeah, it's it's an abstract with a lot of theme. And fans still here? Yeah, I'm just waiting for the subject okay. to end. All I got I, I I got from it that it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful game. It's uh, actually it's a lot of plastic. It could have been a bit of wood, but since a lot of uh, Pandasaurus productions are like this with bright colors, uh, the art is just right. The manual is beautiful. That that's actually the the way you should. Uh, 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 this manual is one of the best manuals I ever read. It's beautiful, it's large, but it's not full of information. It has, It is full of pictures, explanation and stuff. I think I played the game right the first time, which is a lot to say about me. <laughs> All of that time traveling probably isn't good for the laws of physics, and I can only imagine the damage to the very fabric of reality caused over time. Thankfully, Fen is there to introduce us to a way to deal with Eldritch Owl sprawling from underneath a layer of madness with the board game adaptation of Darkest Dungeon. Back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, two men, Chris Morassa and Tyler Sigmund, um, they worked for Backbone Entertainment and became friends. Um, then on and off, moving forward, they sort of, they'd meet up occasionally, they chat, they discuss game ideas. Uh, Tyler had been quite a, uh, quite a, a fan of board games. He produced some back in the day. You can actually find them on Board Game Geek. They're old, like print and play back before people really wanted to print and play stuff because printers were not very good and, um, and similar. But they eventually hit upon this concept of what if, um, adventuring like what are the tolls that a, a person would experience if they had to dungeon delve all the time what would it wear and tear on their mental health um, it's not really something that's covered even today in most um, games and role-playing games they tend to gloss over how stressful it'd be fighting for your life on a regular basis and sleeping outdoors or in slimy caves where a goblin is nearby playing a fiddle terrible things goblins can't play fiddles uh, so they eventually came up with the concept of a game that would become Darkest Dungeon. It was launched on Kickstarter. Uh, there is a fascinating story behind the whole thing. I'm not going to retell it here, but I'm going to point you in the direction of the Escapist Darkest Dungeon documentary. It's titled It Would Suck to Be a Hero. It's on YouTube. It's an hour and eight minutes long. It's engrossing from start to finish and fascinating. Uh, the section about when they added corpses to the game itself is incredibly eye-opening. And how 
how the voice acting for the ancestor grew in scope uh, due to the vocal performance, um, which is, you know, one of those things that everybody, everybody's heard a Darkest Dungeon quote these days, whether they realise it or not. So, the video game itself, you are the descendant of the ancestor, you've received a letter uh, spouting that classic line, ruin, ruin has come to our family, just like that it said, <laughs> yeah, family, you know, Vin Diesel's right there, ready to go, um, and uh, you start off with Dismas and Reynold, a uh, crusader and a uh, bound, nope, a, a, a oh, my goodness, I'm drawing a complete blank. What's um, a highwayman? Highwayman. I wonder. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, and a, a highwayman. I want to say bandit because uh, I was GM in Seventh C yesterday, and they were all Montaigne bandits, all the NPCs in that. So it was slipped my mind. Yeah. So you play through as them on the old road. They arrive, then you take over the hamlet, and gradually you build up the settlement. You venture into about four different. Um, dungeons, there's a fifth dungeon um, that comes into DLC, and a sixth dungeon, the darkest dungeon, that you're kind of free to go into whenever you want, but you probably shouldn't go in before you're ready. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say I think darkest dungeon, I think the framework may be borrowed by Kingdom Death. Settlement building, disposable heroes, going out adventures, very dark, lots of cosmic horror. I, I think, I mean, there's so many games inspired by Darkest Dungeon now, by either the Borrow the Artistic Style, which is based on a 1990s cartoonist, um, a guy who, uh, Rob Leefield did like the original art and then this guy took over the rest of the comic and um, Chris Barassa, I believe who's the artist, was it stuck with him because he thought the art sucked. Uh, and here it is in the game and it's incredibly iconic. So that's the video game. Um, it is a powerhouse. It's got a sequel out now that's landing on Steam later this year. Um, and they've redesigned and revamped the game framework, changing. It's not a set on builder anymore. It's more like a um, ongoing series of roguelike journeys. But it is a phenomenal game. It's a great time sink. It's difficult and hard and very random and swingy at times. So that's the concept. And then in... 2019 Mythic Games announced on Kickstarter they were going to do Darkest Dungeon the board game and they came firing out of the gate with like a pretty solid concept showing like all the models um, a load of the other components and given the aesthetic they it was already created for them all they had to do was translate it across into the game to nail the visuals I can say they've mostly nailed the visuals so I'll start with a brief talk on the components the models, they might be the best plastic models in any game of all time for me personally. They are a <laughs> they are a perfect representation of the characters in the game. You know, translating these two dimensional, very stylized kind of four five head high, four head high, um, slightly deformed characters with this very classic nineteen nineties cartoon slash medieval style, um, putting them together. I would have said it's like really hard to do or, you know, incredibly difficult and I'd expected plastic standees or cardboard standees. But no, they found a sculptor or sculptors who knocked it out of the park. Every single model is a translation of a pose from the game. They are perfect translations. Even the areas they've had to fill in because you never see the back of certain characters fit and it all looks like a complete hole. And they've done this with hundreds of models. I think there's like 140 models in the core game. It's close to that amount. So, yeah. Um, I'm only going to talk about the core game with a brief note on the Crimson Court at the end. Uh, but anyway, let's get into the board game itself. Um, so, first of all, one thing to note. This game suffers immensely from glare issues. Whatever cardboard it's been made of, um, it just picks up and flashes every <laughs> single bit of light into your eyes and it's all black and there's a lack of contrast on some of the pieces as well so the playables are particularly bad there's a stress track at the top and in the prototypes the stress track is done in white and you can see these boxes and you can easily see where the token's moving up and down and the final one it's like a dark gray and so you're squinting there with like 
a torch and a magnifying glass to try and figure out exactly where you're putting your stress track. Um, so you you are telling me that the darkest dungeon is extremely bright. Um, it's extremely reflective. So it's not bright itself, but yeah, it's like, it's like walking into the darkest mirror. You sh it's like, oh, I can't see anything. You turn on a light and you're like, I see too much. The game with solar yeah. flares. And yeah. I've seen the prototype player boards for the characters and I don't know why they changed. So... The cardboard in this game is a bit of a, a mess when it comes to the boards. The rollout mat that you can get is um, also low contrast. It's very pretty. It's useless if you're solo playing. It's fine for two or three players. It's kind of not great for four players because they've really not thought about the space properly. It makes the game feel very cluttered. Um, so it's a combination of really good stunning artwork on a lot of the pieces and then gorgeous artwork that you can't see on some of the other pieces and um just like uh decent tokens but so so many tokens we're going to talk about the tokens a bit later but first of all framework of the game you start off you pick four heroes there's always going to be four heroes that's darkest dungeons thing classic adventuring party um in the core game you have the hellion the occultist the Arbalist, the Crusader, the Abomination, the Grave Robber, the Highwayman, the Jester, the Vastal, Vestal, Vastal, Vestal, the Vestal, Vestal. and the Bounty Hunter, and the Plague Doctor. Um, with the others are in expansions that haven't come yet, and the Musketeer, who is an extra additional piece of content you can order separately, and just like in Darkest Dungeon the game, she's just a variant of the Arbalist, but with different... Um, a different look so you don't need her or you could get her if you want a second arbalist that's it the core game comes with a bunch of common monsters the oddity worth mentioning is that within the common monsters are the snakes the snakes came with the um, shield bearer and they're tied closely to her story but they're not in the same box as the shield bearer so that's thematically a bit odd of a decision but maybe they needed more common monsters to pad things out then there's all the ruined monsters, so that's the skeletons, and the darkest dungeon monsters. So, a fairly large amount they cover. And it's a, you play a whole game through the ruins if you just play the core game. If you want to play the other areas, you'd need the expansions. So, if you want to get everything, um, surprisingly, it could be cheap because Mythic Games keep having to put a fire sale on to get rid of everything because I've talked about how badly they managed their Kickstarters previously. And how much they charged me to get this shipped. Um, 80 euros extra. It, it, it seems that for some people it might just be cheaper to go to a proper store than buying that than if they bought it on the Kickstarter. Yeah, people who bought it through the store during this flash sale have paid less than I did. Yeah, but, but um, you know, I'm not to know that kind of thing is going to happen and... They shouldn't have received their content yet. I've had a chance to play mine quite a bit. So it is what it is. Um, the emails have been mind-boggling. I've shared a couple of those in my community. <laughs> Incredible. I, I don't know who they've got in charge of uh, of their communications, but that person is um, a frantic, I guess. A special mind. I, I mean, you know, kind of almost suggested that the game's an NFT. Uh and that and that's basically when you're buying the game, you're not buying the game, you're buying an investment yeah. because you can sell it for yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can buy this game on the store for a hundred dollars. We retail it for two hundred dollars. But how much is it worth? Three hundred, five hundred? I don't know. I just know the game's gonna get absolutely panned by certain critics. Um others have liked it, um and you know, haven't pointed out its flaws, but uh, we'll get to where I feel. Anyhow, because I've blathered on, we'll get into the loop. You pick your team, you have your hamlet, which starts off with all the buildings, level zero. You will shuffle up the deck of boss cards. You'll draw a boss. There are four ruins bosses. There's the necromancer and the fanatic. Of course, they're the standard bosses for that area. Yeah. They've also made the collector a boss rather than a mini boss. A uh, fine, the collector's kind of cool. Uh, and then the fanatic. The fanatic is from the Crimson Court. So they've kind of peeled him out just like the snakes and stuck him in the main box because... They needed to. Um, I don't mind too much because four bosses is decent. You're going to face three of them over three acts. 
the boss has a global effect throughout the whole of that chapter. So you'll play your first act, you're going to go on a dungeon crawl, then you're going to go on another dungeon crawl, then you're going to go into the boss's dungeon and try and kill it. Um, and if you succeed, you'll go on to act two and then act three, and then off into the darkest dungeon. And each time between a dungeon crawl, you come back to the hamlet, you can pay some gold to upgrade some buildings, buy supplies, improve your skills, improve your characters, um, improve, you know, and uh, just kind of like maybe deal with the stress of dungeoneering. Interestingly, the board game does not heal your health. You've got to get your health healed through money as well. So um, it's an interesting twist. It actually does make the game a lot tighter because, to be honest, the characters kind of have the advantage once they start levelling up. The reason for that is you have a deck of cards for the monsters. All the Act 1 monsters are shuffled in together, the common ones plus the ones for the area you're exploring. When you get to Act 2, those Act 1 monsters stay in the deck. So the monsters kind of fail to keep up. Um, we've gotten over that by house ruling to gradually remove all of the lower level monsters from the deck as the difficulty climbs. Um, when you get to the Darkest Dungeon, like it's all Darkest Dungeon monsters and that's like... That's a treat. That's really crunchy, tough stuff. Okay, so that's fairly simple. You will draw two quests. You'll pick one to go on that tells you the area you're going in, say the ruins most of the time, or at the moment you can do ruins or crimson court if you have that. You'll face various monsters, and uh, the general conceit is you draw a card, a huge, far too large dungeon card that shows a layout just like the darkest dungeon layout. So you've got squares for rooms, dots connecting them, it's a node-based movement system. Um, you will look at the quest card, it tells you a certain number of tiles to pick. You shuffle those and put them face down onto the thing that represents all the rooms. The rooms can contain nothing, uh, they can be a dark room that costs you torches, they can be a trap, they can be a curio room that sometimes has monsters, sometimes doesn't, and they can be a treasure room or a quest room. It's uh, fairly simple um, on that front. Uh, and what you'll do is you just take your party marker from the entrance, move it to the room you're going to, and then you do a pseudo simulation of traveling down the corridor. This is definitely the part of the game where it's a bit kind of, what were you thinking? Every character has to roll two exploration dice. These dice have a bunch of nice things, as in not nice things that can happen, and a blank side. Um, every hero has to roll, so you're rolling eight dice at once. Um, a torch result makes the light level go down by one unless you spend a torch. Hunger, you have to eat food or you suffer health and stress. A uh, shovel, you need to clear your way through. Essentially, um, it does replicate how the corridors are kind of semi-randomly generated, but it doesn't feel good uh, for uh, two reasons that I'll get to. The first one's Curios. So Curios is a deck of cards, common Curios, Curio specifically for that biome. Now in the in the video game, you, you take a different mix of supplies depending on the area you're going to. For example, the Warrens requires more shovels because it's underground, there's been a lot of collapsing. The Wild uh, demands some extra antidotes because there's more poison there. Um, and holy water you take to the ruins. So, so you're always thinking about how much food do I bring, how many torches do I bring, uh, how long is the mission going to be, etc, etc, and you adjust accordingly. That's out of the window here. At the start of the mission, you get two supply dice for each character, plus you can buy extra supply dice, for uh, depending on the price paid in the settlement. And you roll randomly, and you get those random supplies. One side lets you pick, and that's it. And you just... Like, you get random stuff to take with you. So it turns out the strategy is spend as much money as you can on supplies every single run, so you've got a huge pool of supplies. And you want as many torches as possible, because the curios have changed from... In the video game, if you encounter, say, a grave, if you just interact with it without spending anything, womp womp, uh, you could just get... Like, you get don't get as good amount of stuff, or you might even get a bad penalty. If you interact it with a shovel, way you spend the shovel, you dig up the corpse and get some treasure because, you know, uh, it's better than it staying in the ground there. But that's part of the strategy of bringing the right gear for the right curios. Well, no, that doesn't work here. In the game, if you draw a curio, you can choose to spend a torch. If you spend a torch, you get only the good benefits from the curio card. If you don't spend a torch, you get the good and the bad. And these cards can have two, three bad things happening on them. Stress, uh, quirks, negative quirks, 
uh, maybe disease, all sorts of nonsense. So you end up trying to grab as many torches as you can to make the curios positive. Um, this has frustrated a lot of people. I've played Kingdom Death. I've played the Hunt Phase. You've played the Hunt Phase, haven't you, Alexis? I have played the Hunt Phase a couple of times. It sucks, I've been doesn't known it? Known to have. Yeah, it does. Yeah. it's not very interesting. No, it's not. This is at least the Hunt Phase, but faster and broken up into lots of tiny spaces. Um, once I realised I needed to just buy as many supplies as possible, um, it became just one of those things you do. You level up the place that you buy supplies from, buy lots, buy them cheaply. It's not the best mechanic. I really wish they had made it that the curios were flavoured in the way that they are in the game. And so you draw like a skeleton and it would go, if you have a bandage, you get the good stuff. If you don't have a bandage to spend, you have to take all of it. That would have been fine. You know, and they could have done that. They easily could have given each of the areas their own flavor beyond just you draw a random curio and these things happen to you unless you spend a torch. I think it's... sometimes you just have to deal with disadvantage and you don't really get a choice on that. And it doesn't really reward you for making good choice. It's yeah. Yeah, the, you're not making I... the only choice you're making is is just buy as many supplies as possible. Once I got over and then that, I hope that you roll well, right? Um, yeah, to be honest, like because one side gives you your choice of supplies and you roll baseline eight anyway, you're normally pretty well stocked, especially because there's advantages to letting the light level drop a little bit. And of course, there's characters that can pull the light level up, like the Vastal, Vastal? Vestal and the um, uh, Crusader both have abilities that raise the light level. So, you know, that's kind of, it's fine. But I wanted to put that up first because that's kind of the bad part of this game done. I want, I'm going to talk about the good part, which is the combat. So when you enter a room with a battle, um, you will draw four enemies and lay them out on, the, on a track. So they go up on, just like in the game, they'll go from left to right in four rows. And you'll have organised your party the same way. So for example, Crusader at the front, Highwayman behind them, Jester behind that, and a Vestal at the back, because that's the Jestal combo, and that's like a really easy, basic way for new players playing Darkest Dungeon to play. I don't do that. I play dancing. I love dancing my characters back and forth. Um, but uh, anyway, um, and that's how it works in the video game is you have four characters in each side and the game does a lot about you can use certain abilities when you're in a certain position and you can only attack other certain positions on the enemy formation or only target certain positions on your own formation. So the game really matters about where you are. Now, they could have just done that. They could have just done that, and you could, you'd have the tracks, and it would play just like the video game. And that kind of would have been fine, you know? I, I think it would have been like, you know, it would have been okay, but it basically means replicating what the video game does. And when you're doing that, I'm of the opinion, why are you making a game at all? Just go play the video game where there's less overhead, you know? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So, in order to justify the miniatures, I think... What they did is they give you a board and you can move around on it and you move your models around and now you, you can attack the distances that your attacks would normally reach on the ranks. That's the range that you have in your weapons. Um, so you might have a weapon that is like zero. That means someone has to be in the same space as you. Or you might have one that's four. They have to be four spaces away from you. I, don't, I think maybe three is the max. But anyway, it's, it's actually a really cool combat. And on top of that, characters activate in the order in the on the party order. So you shuffle up a deck that has f up to four enemy cards and up to four hero cards, depending on the number of combatants on either side. And you'll draw, and whichever side you draw, the person nearest the front who hasn't acted yet gets to have their go. So in my example, the first hero card drawn triggers the Crusader's turn. And then the first enemy card will trigger the first enemy and the enemies are deployed either front from front to back or from back to front depending on if they're melee or ranged very simple straightforward they have very clean abilities they do different things based on where they are in the party order um so range characters at the front range enemies at the front are kind of bad at their job and melee characters near the back struggle as well uh push and pull abilities move them all around move them on the board like I love this combat. It's so team-based. It's so, like, together and coordinated. Um, I honestly wish more games had used this, this fixed range you can attack at, and this uh, knowing what order everyone's going to act in, you set it up in advance, 
And there's so many strategies as well. You can play like bonk cleric, which is a cleric at the front of the formation with a with a mace and just smacking things with a mace and stunning them. Or you can play right at the back, like a classic healer. Um, you know, you can play a dance party where everyone moves back and forth whenever they activate and each turn their activation order is different. Uh, and all the monsters are behaving in logical ways that match the video game, but translated in a three-dimensional environment. And the boss fights are really cool. They like replicate what's going on in the game, but in an interesting fashion. Um, the collector has the three heads with it. The uh, a necromancer summons yeah, undead. Yeah, the, the collector. Yeah. Um, the fanatic has his pews and so on. Um, not the fanatic, sorry. The prophet has his pews and the fanatic has his pyre. And he'll toss somebody into it. And if you let him toss them into it, then they are toast. It's, it's, it's the best dungeon crawling combat system I've played since Gloomhaven. It's really good. It yeah. is swingy. It is. It's definitely a Meritrash slash thematic in style, but I absolutely adore what it's doing, um, and that's what keeps me coming back to it. In addition, like the characters all have, they have a bunch of skills. At level one, you choose three skills to play with. As you level up to level two, you get an extra trinket slot and an extra skill. And at level three, you get like five skills to play with. Um, you can do so many different things with those combos and you can set up different parties and all sorts of different play styles and just just experiment. And the game is like, hey, go nuts, you know, play your character in the position you want to play based on the skills they've got. Play, play a frontline occultist. I do. So um, I could go on more about this because there's so many things that are great and there's so many things that are terrible. But also, do... go on. <laughs> I, I, I do have a couple of questions. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up and then I'll get to questions. Because right. <laughs> this is my final word on it as far as overall. This is my favorite game that I cannot recommend to people. <laughs> yeah. So if you like what you've heard and you think I can live with the downsides of slightly bad interface, a bit hard to re see everything, um the the travelling between each place is not that engaging, but I want this upgrade in the settlement. I want this positional based crunchy combat where every decision matters and you're scrambling when you miss a hit you need to do something else um it, it is it's a lot of fun but if the if if the elements that sound bad to you sound really bad this is a 200 hundred dollar game that i would not spend money on so that's where well, i stand and let's have questions well fam that's that's not really it's not 200 hundred dollar right What, how much could it be worth? 300, 400? Oh, you never know. I, I reckon on the secondary market, you might be able to flip this NFT for a hot 5 million. It's going all the way to the moon. Um, <laughs> in any case, jokes aside, um, I, I had a, a pretty important question is that I, I quite liked <laughs> The Darkest Dungeon, but I've had trouble getting into it the first few times I tried because the game is very hard. And sometimes if you, uh, until you, properly understand how the game functions sometimes you'll just get uh, rolled over and yeah. and you need to take a certain amount of time to to learn the mechanics and stuff how hard would you say that the dark the bolt game is right so in act one the very first act the game is very challenging um because the scaling on the monsters is tight. Mm. Yeah, when, and as you mentioned, yeah, there's when a, you level a up, which you can do within Act One if you spend enough money, you will pull ahead on a bit of an advantage over the monsters, um, and they struggle to catch up because you end up fighting in Act Two a deck mixed of Act One and Act Two monsters, so it can be a bit swingy. Um, but if if they if you just like you know refine that deck and remove some of the Act One monsters whenever you go up in an act, which is what I do, we just take like one of each out um when there's like two or three of them and so the later dungeons have more of the higher level monsters the challenge returns but heck that's the thing this is the actual combat system is is good enough that being modular about it and just being smart about how you're going to tune your difficulty and the game offers other difficulties as well it works so um i think it, it can be very very hard if you want it to and you can always chip play like a weird party there's more options to go like heck i'm going to play an arbalist and a musketeer and a jester and a grave robber which is like a terrible party in the in the video game well yeah terrible because arbalist and musketeer both want to be in rank four but in this you can do it because suddenly it doesn't matter whether you're both in rank four you can 
you can use your ranged weapon still by um, moving the distance you need to shoot. So hard, yeah. As hard as Darkest Dungeon, definitely not. Um, not All right. accessible. No, that's good to know. Um, because while I can do that for a video game, uh, sometimes a board game where it just takes multiple times to get into it can be not, it can lead to a not very fun evening with friends. Like if you just start the game and then yeah, uh, um, can can continue. Uh, Kingdom Death, for example, is a, a game that yeah. takes a, a fair few. So someone to be a little bit experienced to lead the, the game, otherwise it's just going to be a very frustrating first few games. Yeah, um, you can very easily just kind of jump into Good. this and go, uh, if, if you want to learn, they have like sample parties. And as I mentioned, the one I described, uh, Crusader, High Women, Jester and Vestal is a very robust, simple to use team, very straightforward. Um, or you can play Plague Doctor instead of the Jester. And it just, that that's a very like basic way to play and then you can start messing around with it and you can play like a back rank crusader who does ranged attacker and heals instead and things so yeah you can slide the difficulty up and down by how you play stupidly right. modular characters but that is very nice to know yeah um i i, um, I i'm just so enamored with the combat that it, it makes up for everything else uh, this is a game that I've been I've been looking into uh, for a bit. You, how do you did you enjoy the Crimson Court? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked. Um, so, ah. for those people who haven't played the video game, Crimson Court's a bit notorious for being deceitful. Um, the first mission you play on it, like it's labeled green as easy, and it will kick the heck out of you. <laughs> absolutely not easy it is like at least a veteran level dungeon i don't know why they label it green it's a bit trollish and then each of the <coughs> actual boss missions are mammoth um these days i do them in one um, but that requires a lot of planning and knowing where you're going but they're stupidly big dungeons and you end up playing them over multiple sessions um and as a consequence the crimson court dlc for the video game I would class as like for experienced players and don't play with it to start with. Just activate the flagellant because he's really cool. He's my favorite healer in the game. Um, I love a front rank healer and he's, he does it in a fun way. Um, and I'll come back to it later when you've got more under your belt. In contrast to that, Crimson Court for this, this board game Crimson Court, it's just like another ordinary biome. It's like not obscenely difficult in an unfair way it just feels balanced it feels right all the boss fights are super cool they've translated the mechanics across from you know the uh, baron of this count and countess um you can even like encounter a act one countess which you could never encounter in the video game she's the hardest boss in the game pretty much in the video game um but she has sliding difficulty here so i really like the crimson court yard um dlc uh, dlc make expansion box um I'm, I'm, you know, like surprised how much I like it. There's a deluxe edition. Ignore that. It just has some alternative sculpts that have zero mechanical function whatsoever. Like nothing. No point to them. I'm not even going to paint all of them because I don't see the reason to have six copies of a model I only ever need three of. But um, the normal version doesn't have all those extras. Uh, it's it's great. If the other um, if the other three locations are done as well as the Crimson Court, I think this game's going to be popping on my table for a, like, medium-length campaign game every once in a while. Uh, it's definitely not something you can play in one session, but you could play it over one, two months. And I have a gap within my play schedule for games like that. So I give a thumbs up to the Crimson Courtyard. And the only thing I think they did wrong is they typoed an encounter that's two crocodilians. Um, there's only one crocodilian in the box, um, and that has to be a crocodilian in an adder. That's it. That's that's like there's a few minor typos on other cards and bits pieces here and there. I've seen worse. But yeah. Darkest dungeon. I I don't think ruin has come to the board game, but maybe it's come to mythic games. Oh. <laughs> well, not if they sell all of those blocks at on eBay for a massive markup. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're going to sell them to themselves and flip them. I mean, surely, no, no, you wouldn't do that kind of insider trading. That'd be crazy. <laughs> so, uh, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, you can catch up, uh, catch us at uh, patreon.com slash thelaststandy with two E. 
Uh, and until next time, we have been The Last Andy. So it's a goodbye from Alessio. Bye. Fen. Overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. Myself, goodbye. And remember that the second E is in standee is for Econite. <laughs>